Well, good morning. Yes, we are continuing in our, uh, our passion series and talking about the different kinds of love. Remember, the first week was fueled by love. Last week was humble love. And tonight, today, we're going to be talking about Jesus' perfect love. Perfect love. And then the next week, we will end the series with unstoppable love as we go right into Palm Sunday. I think next week is Palm Sunday, right? Yeah, it's the... The, the, the day that Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem, and it's the day that Marlene has to learn how to play the palms all over again, right? Because <laughs> we do that here in this church. Uh, so we'll make sure we get that in, and uh, hopefully you'll be here. If you've, if you've never heard the song, The Palms, it's amazing. Uh, and not many churches know it or do it, but we still keep the, con- the, con- the tradition going. As long as we have someone to play it. Okay. Anyway, so yes, today we're talking about perfect love. And uh, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started here. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel. And uh, Lord, as we come to this morning, we admit that we look for love in many different places all our lives have been let that, and have been let down. And some of us are weary from the search, Lord. Help us today to com- have complete trust and faith in your perfect love and help us to remain in your love through all the ups and downs of our life. And speaking of prayer, I wanted to mention that we forgot to uh, mention that uh, uh, Sandra's, Sandy's uh, cousin uh, needs prayer because he's, I think, in his 30s and he has uh, heart problems and uh, they don't expect him to live for uh, two, two weeks to a month right now. So uh, we just want to keep uh, your family in prayer, Sandy, and, uh, and thank you for bringing that to our attention, and we will continue to keep his, him in prayer. His name is Aaron. You can put him on your prayer list this week, and uh, not just for him, but for his family during this time too. All right? Thank you. All righty. So let's, let's talk about perfect love. I hope you guys have had a good week so far. Like I said, we're in our third week of the Passion series, uh, Perfect Love, and we remember that it wasn't Jesus's, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for humanity, love for you. Not just the love for the people that he had the days that he was living on earth, but for all humans, all time. That's pretty amazing. Who could have love for all humans all time? Well, only God. And Jesus was and is God, 100% God, 100% man. That's 200%. You go, that doesn't make sense, Pastor. I know. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I believe it because Jesus is alive today. So it gives me hope to believe that. So there are some things in the Bible we will never understand on this side of heaven, I believe. And maybe even some things we won't understand on the other side of heaven that God doesn't want us to understand. Like I I personally, and this is my own speculation, I don't think we will ever know the actual amount of suffering that Jesus went through to us. And I'm not talking about physical suffering on the cross, although that was horrible and bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the psychological suffering that he, that he shared with the world, with God, with all humanity, because of our sin. I was listening to a pastor the other day. You know, actually, it was last night, actually, not the other day. And, uh, and I call this guy a, a pastor and a Christian. He's from back east somewhere. But he was talking about how Christians love John 3.16. And yes, we do. He says, but isn't it sad that they only talk about uh, the last part of the verse is that God sent his only son. And they forget that, you know, for God so loved the world. And and this guy was totally off the rails, okay? It's uh, it's called the UCC, United Church of Christ. uh, And I'm not going to say any more about it, except that he, he was claiming that we're upset that we believe that God made a way for us only through Jesus Christ and no other way. It's like, well, yeah, he did, right? That, I mean, that's, that's why we worship Jesus. I mean, if Jesus, if, if there was any other way for God to show his love for us and the fact that we can be reunited with him in perfect fellowship and harmony with him, if there was any other way than Jesus going to the cross, don't you think God would have done it? And if we think there's some other way, then what Jesus did on the cross means nothing. 
But God had that perfect love by sending, sending Jesus for us. That's deep, guys. Okay? Yes. People say, you know, you Christians, you, you just say that, you know, that Jesus is the only way, and that's not, that's not nice. Well, I don't care if it's nice or not. It's true. It's, be, it's beyond nice. It's loving. It's perfect love, right? And I, by the way, I'm not saying this. Jesus says this. The Bible says this, right? I mean, if it were my way, and it, thank goodness for all you, it's not my way, right? I would have started over, first of all, okay? Everybody would have been wiped out. It would have started all over the brand new creation. There would have been no flood where people were saved and still had human sin in them, and still Jesus had to come. I would have just started all over, but, but God didn't do that. He loved humanity so much that he sent Jesus. Also, for my way, if I think if you lived a pretty good life, you get into heaven. But it's not my heaven. It's not your heaven. It's God's heaven, right? God has rules. You know, we don't, we don't discount God's love. We love, we love that God loves us. The Bible tells us we love God because he first loved us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Yeah, amen. But... Uh, but God is more than love. He's also just, right? And he needed righteousness, us to be righteous, to be able to dwell with him forever in heaven. Because God can't have anything impure, any impurities around him. And that's why Jesus came, to give us God's righteousness. He was that willing sacrifice. He had that perfect love and the love is so perfect that the Bible tells us that he looked with joy to the cross. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. But let me tell you about a time that uh, I was running a race. It was a 5K, believe it or not. You look at me going, you ran a 5K once? Yeah, I did, okay. Uh, I did. And I, I, and I ran a 5K in army boots with a rucksack on full of equipment because... That's what you did in basic training, right? But in order to be able to run that 5K, that was like the last, it was like, I think it was a week before we had graduation from basic training. So for two months, we were in hard training to get ready for that 5K. And because, by the way, if you didn't, I don't, I don't know how the, how the rules are now, you know, uh, the way, but back then, when I was in it, if you didn't pass the 5K, Guess what you got to do all over again? Basic training. So we were motivated to get that 5K done, right? Some of us came scraping through at the very end, and I was one of those, but I made it, all right? Some didn't finish it, and they had to redo basic training. Because in the Army, it's important that you can move. You move, shoot, and communicate. Those are the three things you're supposed to do. You move, because you go from one place to another, and you have time limits to get there. So we had to practice, and we practiced, and, and when I say practice, we ran all over the place. And I'd never run so much in my life, into, and I'd never run that much ever again, okay? Uh, but the thing is, it, it was hard. It was very, very hard. If we had to, you know, you get out of chow, you're full, and you have to run to your next, uh, whatever the mission was that day, right? You don't just walk to the mission. Uh -uh. If Joel Sargent sees you walking, you get down and do push-ups. So you wish you were running, okay? Uh, but we ran everywhere and did everything at a quick pace. And then when we got to where we were supposed to go, we waited. That's a, hurry up and wait is the Army's philosophy. But anyway, uh, so we ran everywhere, and it was miserable and awful. But we ran because we knew we had to finish that 5K or we were going to be recycled and start basic training again. And nobody wanted to do that. So it was hard, but we didn't look at the pain that we were going through at the time. We looked at, hey, let's get through this so that we can move on to the next section, right? Well, the Bible talks about uh, Paul. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 26. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. So they do it to obtain a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as to, 
not to run aimlessly. I box in such a way as to avoid hitting the air. I always wonder what that meant, but it means, you know, when you, when you, when you throw a punch at somebody in, in boxing, if you don't connect, you use more energy by missing. So you want to basically, what it's saying here is practice makes perfect. But I'm going to go a little further than that. As a magician, when I'm practicing my sleight of hand and stuff, if I don't practice it perfectly, then when I do it in front of an audience, then I'm going to do it wrong. So it's not just practice makes perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect, right? And so this is what Paul is talking about here. He says, he says we run to get an, Im, an imperishable, imperishable crown, an uh, imperishable wreath, rather, okay? okay? There's people that train for the Olympics, train for everything, even, even the, well, right now, baseball is going on, uh, spring training. They're training to get ready for the main season. In the main season, they play that so they can get to the postseason and win the World Series. One team is going to win the World Series. I hope it's the Dodgers. Okay? Uh, right? I, I, when I say hope, I don't really have my faith and trust in the Dodgers. I just kind of hope it's the Dodgers. Okay? Okay. Uh, I know, some of you are going, wait a minute, I thought you loved the Dodgers. I do, I do, but you know, I know how things go. There's injuries that happen in the season and stuff like that. But the point is, you know, who could tell you who won the World Series in 1937? Do you know Albert? Yeah, see? Um, and that was important to that team at the time, right? But that was a perishable crown. We have an imperishable crown that we are running for. And the great thing about us as Christians the race that we're running with Jesus is a race that we can all win. We can all get to heaven. There's a great song, when we all get to heaven, what a joy, of, a day of rejoicing that will be, right? And so we have eternal crown in mind specific to the calling. Let's look at Hebrews now. Hebrews 12, I think I have it here. Yes, one through two. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross." despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, we are all called to run a similar race. While running through life, it's important that we do so with endurance. Endurance requires commitment to the cause and invites us to never give up hope crossing the finish line. But how do we do that? We do that by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, right? Knowing what we are doing here. Knowing that this is temporary. And Jesus, as we know, he was the perfecter of our faith while we run the race. God is able to refine us as we run the race with endurance. But how does this happen? What is required from us in order to experience this? Well, I mentioned it earlier. Okay, we look to the cross. We look to the cross of Jesus on the cross there. If we desire to experience Jesus Christ personally day by day, we must be willing to to fix our gaze upon the cross. As humans, we experience this ongoing conflict where we fix our gaze versus where we glance. For many here today, many maybe have felt empty recently. You might have felt as if you don't have much to give and today you're here seemingly out of obligation. Maybe it's because you're glancing at God while glance, gazing at the world. I want to challenge you to make the switch today. Gaze at God and glance at the world. Right? That's, that's what Christ is calling us to do. I want you to invite you to spend time gazing at God and beholding him. Gazing at God invites us to spend time with him constantly. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he says, Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. See, fixing our gaze on Christ means praying when we are in the car, when we are in a coffee shop, <laughs> when we drop off our kids at school, when we are getting groceries, everywhere. 
And it's not just, oh, God, give me a parking space close to the store, okay? Although, you know, that might be a prayer. I don't know. I, I'm not sure God always answers that prayer. But, uh, but God wants us to involve him in our lives all the time. How should we pray? Without what? Without ceasing. That means all the time. Constantly focused on God. In, and in everything, give thanks. Hey, you got a new promotion at work? Give thanks. Things aren't going well? Give thanks. You're suffering for the cause of Christ? Give thanks. Paul did that. He suffered for the cause of Christ, and he gave thanks, right? There is no limit to the amount of time that we can spend with God in numerous different ways. All the time we spend with God is meant to direct our focus back to the cross, it's where our hope lies in any and every season of life while running the race. As we direct our focus to the cross, God is able to refine and protect our faith. He is able to take us deeper in prayer and deeper in his word. In other words, getting more like Jesus, knowing more about God and having him in our lives more and being more conformed to his will, right? However, allowing God to perfect our faith does not just include gazing at the cross, okay? The Bible makes it clear there will be hard times we face when running the race. We will have to learn how to endure frustration, pain, and hardship, just like I did in basic training, again, for an imperishable crown, okay? The crown was not having to repeat basic training, right? But here, Jesus actually tells us in John 16, 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you so that you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. It doesn't say you may have tribulation or it may happen. You know, you have it. It's already here. Okay? Life is already going to be hard even without Jesus. He says, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And then James says here, oh, wow, this is, here's, Here's James 1, 2. This is really, I think this should be like the, the slogan to invite people into Christianity. Ready? Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. <laughs> hey, where do I sign up? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it, he basically, you know, he's not sugarcoating it. James says, stuff's going to happen. All right? These are just a couple of passages that reiterate a constant message you'll find throughout the Bible. Even Jesus had to endure trouble, pain, prosecution, and suffering. Last week, we talked briefly about the anguish he felt just before being arrested. Remember, we were talking about him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed and asked God to let this cup pass from me. However, he was ultimately willing to endure the cross, as Hebrew says, for the joy set before him for the sake of you and me experiencing new life. If we want our faith to be refined and perfected, chances are we will have to go through the fire. And here's what Paul says elsewhere in Romans 8.17. Maybe another verse for join, having people join Christianity. I don't know. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him, there's just something beautiful about suffering. It's hard to understand. I just know that the guys that I was with in that platoon when we were racing and working hard to get through that 5K, training up to it, there was a bond that we all had. It's a bond of suffering, if you will. You know, We all hated our sergeant at the time, right? <laughs> it kind of brought us together to work together and be brothers. You know, If one was lagging, we'd pull the other one up. Just so you know, I wasn't one of the ones that was lagging, all right? I, I, I got through it. But uh, there were people that, you know, and we, and we pulled them up. Uh, I remember there was one exercise we did, and we all had to cross the finish line. And a lot of guys, this was at the very beginning of uh, basic training. It was, I think, like two weeks into it. And the sergeant said, this is the mission. You need to get this ammunition from here to there and, and go do it now. He didn't tell us how to do it. He said, do it. And so we lost a few guys on the way. And uh, so we, we, we did it, Sergeant, we did it within time frame. And they said, so where's the rest of your platoon? What do you mean? We're here. 
He goes, no, no, this was a team effort. Go back and get them. So we had to go back and get the guys that, you know, weren't able to keep up. But the point is, is, you know, as Christians, we, we encourage each other because we're all going through, hopefully, you know, the same suffering for Christ. Now, it's interesting. In Sunday school this morning, we were talking uh, about 1 Peter 2.20, and listen to what it says here. This is kind of interesting. I don't have this up on the board because uh, I couldn't find it when I was doing the research, but it actually came up this morning in Sunday school. It says, for what credit is there if when you sin, you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. In other words, Peter's saying, he says, you know, don't think you're suffering for God's righteousness if you're suffering because of some sin that you did. Like, okay, really bizarre example. Let's say you go rob a liquor store, you get shot in the leg, and you say, oh, I'm suffering for God now. No, no, that's not what Peter's talking about, right? That's not that kind of suffering. He's talking about, you know, living the best life you can for God as you're doing it and being persecuted by other people. That's the kind of suffering that Peter's talking about here. That's the suffering that draws us together. And quite honestly, in America, we really have no idea what it means to suffer for Jesus. You know, I've, I've heard other Christians on, on social media go, you know, it's not fair that they're putting down Christians and doing this and that, and they're, they're saying bad things about us. And, you know, but, and then someone will say, well, that's the cross you have to bear, or that's the suffering. No, that's, that's not suffering. Suffering, I believe, that, that Paul was talking about and Peter was talking about was what they were going through at the time. They were personally... the the people at the time were being persecuted for knowing Jesus, for rejecting the gods of the Romans and accepting Jesus as their one king, their Lord and savior. Rome didn't like that. Rome wanted everybody to give allegiance to Caesar. And sure, you know, Jesus said, render under Caesar what Caesar's. He's talking about a coin, not worship, right? These early Christians were willing to go to their deaths proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the kind of suffering that I believe the Bible is talking about. Uh, so as we do this, though, we need to remember that we're not alone, okay? All throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he was reminding people that, that he was not alone. God the Father was directing his steps. Jesus was finding moments, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, to spend one-on-one -on -one time with his Father. And the great thing is we can do that because Jesus made a way for us to do that. He went to the cross, rose again from the dead, rose into heaven then, and ascended into heaven. And that gives us the ability to boldly go to the throne, as Hebrews tells us, boldly go to the throne and talk to God. We can do that. Jesus models for us what it means to be fully reliant on God's strength and God's plans. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in when we realize what it means that we are never alone and we are willing to allow God to lead us through difficult things. Anybody ever had a time in your life when things were difficult? Maybe some personal suffering you had or you saw somebody going through some personal suffering, suffering uh, and you came out of it? It was just for a season. You know, this too shall pass, right? Uh, it was just for a season. But then you look back and you realize God had a reason for that. And we believe that all things work to the good. Romans tells us that, and that's, where, that's the verse we're going to end with later, but we're not ready for that yet. So it's experiences like this where Jesus perfects and refines our faith, right? It happens when you're solely reliant on God's ability and willingness to lead us through life. We must learn to trust him have faith, and learn to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit that is living in us. John 14, 16 says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you for how long? Forever. Forever. That's a great promise that Jesus gives us. That's a promise we can take to the bank, the bank of God, all right? Not, not man's bank, but... That is a great promise. Jesus himself says that the Holy Spirit will never leave us. Whether you're enduring a tough season right now or one that is producing much fruit, 
Give glory to God for his faithfulness in never leaving or forsaking us and for giving us the Holy Spirit. We are truly never alone in the journey. Your friends may forsake you, but Jesus never will. God never will. The Holy Spirit will always be there with you. The perfect love of Christ for his church is an amazing gift and an encouragement. And it's worth remembering that Christ learned perfect love. He received perfect love directly from his heavenly Father. And this is kind of interesting if you think about this, because as Christians we believe in the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even before God created the universe and got it ready for us, the crown of his creation, humans, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit already were in perfect love together. They didn't need to create us. Thank God, literally, that he did, amen, that we get to live with him forever, that we're part of his creation. And so John 15, 9 says, Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. Jesus, the Savior of mankind, is asking us to remain in his perfect love. Don't go looking for it anywhere else. You're not going to find it. Stay, remain, and learn to abide in the love of Christ. As many of us here know all too well, we're not going to find unconditional, all-powerful love of Christ from some counterfeit God or vocation or hobby or worldly relationship. Those are just patches we think can fill the hole that we have in our heart for God, right? But we find that if we put all of our, our trust and our hope in something that isn't God, it's just like grains of sand sifting through our hands. It, it, it's temporal. It doesn't mean anything, right? Now, if you've been looking for this kind of love in these types of relationships, let me invite you back to Christ today. All right? And if you haven't had an invitation to Christ, this is your invitation today. If you know about Christ but have strayed, again, come back to him. The Bible tells us that he is willing and able, to, he is faithful to forgive us our sins if we come back to him. First John, right? Maybe you've never given your life wholly to the, cap to the ever capable hands of Christ. Again, let me invite you to talk to him today. I'll be here after we're done with the message today. If anybody would like to come up and talk about that relationship, I'd love to share what I know and what, what God has taught me and how you can get started with that. All right? I'm inviting you to receive the perfect love of Christ. He will never leave you, never forsake you. His love will be perfect. He will remain faithful to you till the end of time. And Jesus says this here in Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to follow all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you. How long? Always to the end of the age. And then finally, Romans 8, 28, we're going to end with this. Even though you may be going through storms in your life, things that are suffering, look what Romans 8, 28. This is a nugget just for Christians. This isn't for the outside world. This is just for Christians. He says, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God. That's why I say it's just for Christians. It's Christians that love God the way God wants them, him to love them. Love him, not following some other path, but the path of Jesus to God, right? For those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. So as we finish this week, let's just remember that God's love is perfect. Jesus showed that perfect love by going to the cross for each one of us in this room. And for those of us that aren't in this